some people, some of the previous speakers have talked about being brought up in a family involved in fishing. Um, you can switch that off. Yeah. Um, I, I was too, and it was a, a lot of influence on me, I think, and so I'm going to talk a fair bit more about my family than everybody else has done to date, my family experience. Um, because I can't remember it, I've got to read it. So unfortunately, I'll be reading a fair bit about my past experience. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, congratulate National Parks Association on holding this forum. I'm, I've written down here as part of my speech the objectives, so I won't go through them because I'll run out of time, but I really think they're right and I really think we've done pretty well so far to stick to them. The views that I'm going to express are, are my own, not the views of the NPA or any other group. I hope that at least some of them are held more broadly across the conservation movement. Um, I'm listed on the workshop program as a, the former acting conservation rep on Solitary Island Marine Park Advisory Committee. There probably it should be short term added to that somewhere. I wasn't there for long. Um, but since the state election in March 2011, we haven't had anything to do. We've received no official or unofficial contact or advice from the department about the future of the committee. We were not contacted or consulted or even referred to in the Marine Parks Audit. And I think we can all probably agree that that's a disgraceful way to treat a group of citizens who put many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of voluntary hours into advising the government on how to manage its marine parks. So if we can put up things we can all agree, I'd like to put up that one. Um, sorry, Nicola, you've had to take it on behalf of the government, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, um, because my stint was only on the Marine Park Advisory Committee was only short, I'm going to give a bit of my background to get it on the record. Um, forming my attitudes towards fish and, and marine environment started when I was about four or five. Um, I remember my father bringing home some twisted old um, branches off a tea tree out of a swamp at a place called Saltwater at the back of Taree. Uh, he was a woodwork teacher, so he, he quickly moulded those into, into elbows and a bow piece for what was later, or in fairly short time, be, become a 16-foot clinker-built boat that he built in the backyard at home. Um, <coughs> I remember him well steeping the planks in a big long pipe with a fire under the end of it. Um, I also, I, I, I helped him a bit, <laughs> not very much. Um, I remember scattering the, uh, the very precious copper nails and washers all through the grass in the backyard. Um, they were very expensive at the time, and I think he had to revert to illegal means to actually get them. It was only a few years after the war, so me scattering them around the long grass in the backyard wasn't very helpful. Um, uh, I recall the first time a boat was launched by a crowd of people um, pushing it on specially built ladders um, draped with seaweed across the beach at Blackhead. Um, my dad and his crew had no idea <coughs> where to go when they first launched the boat, so they went about half a mile offshore. Um, we, could from, we could watch them from the shore, and we had binoculars, and I remember this clearly. We could see them fairly quickly catching fish. They fished there for in about an hour or so and came home to great joy, and the bottom of the boat was just covered in fish. And he, he said, this is not a fish story, but he, he really had a catch as good in times gone by beyond that. Um, so, um, this, it's not a fishy tale, but in the early years of, of our life then, our fridge was continually stacked with fish and we seemed to eat fish fillips, flathead rows, <laughs> endlessly for breakfast, lunch and dinner. So we lived on fish, it was a real economic um, it, benefit to our family. Our family had a shack, a shack or a weekend or a beachfront, on the beachfront at Blackhead Beach near Taree. Uh, we used to head out there on Friday halves, regularly, almost every weekend. Um, on Saturday mornings, the weather and sea being favourable, a couple of Dad's mates would rock up between six or seven <coughs> in the morning. Um, quite often um, the worst for wear for a Friday night out, and quite often they just didn't, didn't make it. But if things were good, they'd go fishing. Um, they generally got chased home before midday by the um, nor'easter. They cleaned their fish, they sunk half a dozen or more bottles of home brew, slept it off, <laughs> or had lunch, slept it off and did it all again on Sunday. So it was a, um, when one of the fishermen did not turn up, um, one of the kids was often invited to go fishing. We 
quickly got taught that there aren't only two fish that were any good. You got abused if you got caught anything else in the sea, and they were they were snapper, which was well in front of flathead, but nothing else. Any, anything else was, was just discarded unless it was useful for bait. Um, we were taught at a young age that beach fishermen were a second class as a citizen, and the fish that they caught the um, um, would, would just um, would just barely bait quality. So um, fishing was pretty good those days. Uh, um, over time, the fishermen went further out to sea. Um, the catches declined and their effort increased. Um, first of all, it was a proud acquisition of a, a smelly old grey <laughs> second-hand Massey Ferguson tractor to drag the boat up the beach. That was followed some time later, and this was a really big decision, um, by a um, shiny transfer, transition to a shiny tinny. The clinker-built boat was retired to the calm waters of Wallace Lake. Shiny clinker-built boat with an equally shiny but equally cantankerous um, outboard on it as, as the inboard was in the clinker-built boat. Um, sometime into my dad's fishing years, I, I went away from the coast to Armidale and into Canberra and unfortunately lost um, touch with the coast and the surfing and the fishing lifestyle. And delightfully though, my partner and I did spend one year, our first year living together um, down at Gind on the banks of the lake at Jindabyne um, it's a real summer of, of fishing for trout, um, using, um, not cockroaches, using grasshoppers on, on floats. We filled the fridge and we, we even gave away enough fish to cater for a wedding, one of our friend's wedding down there. That was, that was a, a magnificent year. Um, during one stint living in Canberra, I became enamoured to eating gemfish, which were plentiful, cheap and quite a good taste, quite an edible fish, now critically endangered. And I mostly managed to avoid it, though occasionally it comes, appears at Woolly Supermarket and generally still at a fairly cheap price. And I think that's bycatch. Um, I have to say, as a spoke conservationist in recent years and up until this week at least, my fish of choice for Friday night fish and chips uh, has been blue grenadier or hokey. Um, it's imported frozen from New Zealand. And the only species in southern Australasia, only marine species in southern Australasia, as I understand, that's received a sustainability certificate from the um, International Marine Stewardship Council. Um, I won't even suggest that I might get agreement on my choice of fish <laughs> being hokey. Um, but there's a bit of a bit of a sting in the tail of that story because I did a little bit of research for this for this presentation and. Um, on the website, I came across a report that in 2010, that group been mentioned before today, Greenpeace added blue grenadier or hokey to their red list. Um, that red list, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, um, is a list of fish that are commonly sold in supermarkets around the world, um, which have a very high risk of being sourced from unsustainable fisheries. So I didn't buy fish and chips on Friday night. <laughs> I did on Saturday night at the NPA dinner, have barramundi, and because my wife had been away for a couple of weeks and came home last night, I bought her favourite green prawns, and we had curried green prawns from the co-op for tea. So I, we still certainly eat fish, but I'm a bit confused about the hokey. Um, I, I suspect, though, nevertheless, we'll be able to agree that seafood certification programs um, have uh, potentially powerful tools for both... Um, both conservationists and for the industry to promote or promote their interest or their product. And I think they'll be used increasingly in the future, and I'm sure they will be by the conservation movement if land-based conservation programs are any, any guide. So I think they're, they're coming around the corner more and more. Um, more recently, the influences on my position since I've been in Coffs Harbour, and I'll, I'll, I'll name three of them. The first one was a, a prominent local fisher who said to me, I don't care if you lock up 20% as long as I have a say in which area it is. A second one, a, a prominent professional fisherman said to me, if I had my way, I would ban prawn trawling. I want some fish left for my kids. And the third one is a prominent local businessman, quite a figure in town, and a local political figure who said to me after I'd addressed the, a business group in town years ago, I used to go fishing out in the solitary islands, but I don't bother anymore because all the big ones are gone. Um, they were his words. He went on to say, um, on, with his business hat on, 
We've always planned for the future of the harbour on an increasing fishing industry. I now realise it's not going to grow. In fact, it's in decline and we will have to change our thinking. So a prominent, very prominent person in town. Um, perhaps that sort of thinking might be coming to the fore with the recent rumours that Lands Department is apparently refusing or going to refuse to renew the, the lease for the, um, for the boat ramp, the slipway. Um, that rumour's floating around pretty strongly. Um, then again, when I reflected on that story last night, I, I realised that there's a council, council election in the offing. And I fear that it's the old guard at work again, um, trying to free up the site for a grandstand announcement of a multi-storey, high-class coastal development that they have longed for for years. And I hope we can also agree to oppose that if it comes out as a proposal. Um, well, that's probably done the introduction. Now I come to the difficult bit. I, I have the dilemma of trying to make a positive contribution um, to this forum in the, the time that's left. I thought of going through the recent independent audit report on marine parks, the recommendations and seeing how many of them we may be able to reach agreement on or not, but I thought others might all do that. And uh, I think it's, it's, a bit, it's, all, it's a bit over for that. It's the submissions, the original submission clearly favoured the conservation line. I think the audit report favours the conservation line and the recent submissions closed a week ago favour the conservation line as well as the submissions on the Grey Nurse Shark discussion paper some months ago, overwhelmingly um, favouring the conservation line, I believe. So I won't go there. <laughs> I, I'd like to go um, to what I call a, a regional landscape, and my first scratch at a region's pretty large. I'll go all the way to Holland, in fact. Um, Greenpeace, that group that got a mention a while ago, those hokey eater haters, um, have just held up for one week the departure of the super trawler, FV Margiris, the second largest fishing trawler in the world, from coming, that's set on exploiting Australian fish stocks. I would hope that all fishers and all conservationists can combine to fight off this threat. And to that end, I see some positive signs of cooperation between the Greens, the conservationists and the fishers in Tasmania, and I hope that bears fruit. Um, conservationists, including many in this room, have been fighting for 40 to 50 years for the conservation of landscapes within these coastal catchments. Um, in the last 15 years, they've been successful in removing industrial scale logging and clearing out of over a million hectares of the forests in our catchment. They've succeeded in moderating the logging practices that cause severe erosion in another 500,000 hectares of the catchments of these north coast streams. I would argue that is that the most revolutionary change we've had in, in, since management, modern management has been applied to the management of our catchments and potentially our water quality. So I would like to think that the Fishers um, Group would recognise the achievements, the work and the achievements by the conservation group in, in bringing forward the protection of 30 to 50 per cent of the, the catchments, including steep lands, um, that, that determine our water quality. Um, on the north coast, after a, a major fight to remove coastal sand mining, um, part of the outco conservation outcome has been a high level of protection along the landward edge of about 50 per cent of our coastline. Um, along with that has come the provision of a host of roads, walkways, walking tracks, parking areas, camping areas for coastal fishers. Far more than provided by any other party, I think, and I'm confident that we can agree that these wonderful protected areas in the coast are a better place for us and for our future generations, um, rather than if they were not, not protected in that form. So I think that's another achievement we might be able to reach agreement on. Um, moving to coastal wetlands, it's a bit come lately. Over the last, last 10 years, conservationists have um, managed to influence about 2 million per annum on the purchase and restoration and rehabilitation of coastal wetlands. Um, and I'd like to move to my first slide. This was some work I was involved in um, about five, commissioned about five years ago. At that stage, only 12% of the wetland communities were considered to be in good conservation status, 17% fair, 71% poor. The status may have changed slightly then because we've, um, we've had about eight years of $2 million a year land acquisition. 
Um, but that is really, by anybody's measure, I inadequate level of reservation of those very important um, coastal communities. Thanks. Um, somebody, somebody might say, and it's almost 30 years since it's been implemented, SEP 14, protecting coastal wetlands, doesn't it protect them? It's, not, it's, a, it's a development control measure, it's not a long-term management measure, and it misses out heathland, wetland, shrubland, mallee wetlands, forest and woodland wetlands. So the SEP, yes, SEP 14, almost 30 years ago, did put a halt on development. I know two brothers on the banks of the Clarence River who had commissioned a laser level survey and were ready to clear and flatten and level their property for sugar cane when SEP 14 came in. It's a nature reserve now. Um, so it did have its impact, but it's not a long-term management mechanism. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I did some, this is some more work I did when I worked with National Parks. We identified that there were 156,000 odd hectares of, of priority wetland areas on the north coast for reservation. Um, of those, priority one, they're the, in the best condition, generally, 90,000 hectares of priority two and three. Um, recently, a lot of literature is starting to come out about the value of wetlands for carbon sequestration and storage. Probably the, the priority two and the priority three wetland areas um, have the greatest potential for that because they've been disturbed and drained more. So I would like to think that that whole 156,000 hectares should, in time, um, be protected, its habitat values released there. Um, one thing about restoring coastal wetlands, that some of it is quite straightforward at an absolute minimum level. All, all you have to do is put a block across the drains, the, the flood drains, and you've blocked that system, but preferably better levels of restoration are desirable. Um, at the current rate, um, about one to two thousand hectares a year are being, are being purchased and restored, so it would take us uh, about 100 years to get there. I'd like to think we could work out a way of, of going quicker. Thanks. I'll just, some, these are some of the maps. Um, that's, we've got Lismore at the top, Ballina, that's the Bunga Walburn area. Here's some of the mapping of the priority one, two and three. That's the, the big browns, the big Bunga Walburn area. Here's down near Urigir, um, Bunjalung National Park. There, um, that's just an example of it. If you throw in coastal lowlands, um, yeah, next one, please. You throw in coastal lowlands, which are recently mostly be, being listed as endangered ecological community. Also, yeah, you cover much more of the map. And if you join them together, you um, <laughs> cover a fair bit of the map. But there is a lot of coastal lowland and wetland out there that could be. Um, purchased, I believe, put into secure reserves, restored, and it would have an incredible additional contribution on water quality and web catchment management. And I, th I would like, love to explore with representatives of the fishing industry if we can move forward. Um, if I can move to the next slideshow, thanks. Um, there's, there's, one, there's a couple of councils doing pretty good work in this. There's no, absolutely no leadership from the state government, but probably the council doing best, and it's just received a a national or federal government award is the Great Lakes Council. And admittedly it was stimulated when quite a number of people got poisoned by oysters of well, now about 15 years ago, but they have spent a lot of money and they've got a very good program since. Uh, yeah, that one, just the first one, thank you. Sorry? Oh, okay. This is a bit complicated. I don't know whether we can read. I got these slides from Great Lakes Council um, and they've worked their program has involved purchasing and restoration of wetlands, particularly high, high acid sulphate risk areas. They've even had a major program in um, My Lakes National Park for stabilisation of fire trails and dunes. They've had programs on agricultural land for fencing off streams, for rehabilitation of farmland, etc. It's a very comprehensive program across all land tenures. The least cooperative land manager <laughs> down there is State Forest. Um, uh, it is really an outstanding program. You can go through these here fairly quickly. Through the next one, I've, um, I am encouraging NPA to go and have a look at this. Maybe the fishers and the NPA could go and have a look at it. Um, if we agree with this program that's heading in the right direction to address some of those water quality catchment protection issues that we all raise, 
um, maybe we could endorse it and say it should be a model program and even we could suggest that maybe that should go further and um, could become develop a concept of a program for truly healthy coastal rivers in New South Wales. Um, certainly I, ha I, I have a view towards that <laughs> um, and I'd, I'd really like to have serious um, discussion between the groups on that. Um, thanks very much. I'll switch it off for a while. Um, coming back to Earth, perhaps, seven minutes I've got left, I'll get to the really, some of the serious bit. Uh, I'd like to suggest that we might be able to agree um, that seeking political favours and support for our interests is a, is a bit of a fickle pursuit. The um, hunters and fishers have got control of the upper house at the moment, but that may not last forever. At the federal level, in my view, it's even at two all in major marine conservation initiatives. The Howard government expanded Great Barrier Reef Marine Park from 4%, I think, to 30% in sanctuary zones. The, it's still spending money, and I believe the, the compensatory amount allocated to the fishing industry is up to $250 million. That was the Howard government. It set up the framework for the National Marine Protected Areas that Labor is now trying to finish off. That was originally set in place, and one region was addressed by the Howard government. Alternative Labor governments have they originally, at the federal level, set up the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and they're currently completing um, that framework of protected areas right around Australia that the Howard government commenced. Um, and of course, everybody wants to save whales, <laughs> even Tony Abbott at the moment, I think he's saving a few snakes. In his <laughs> um, at a state government level, um, the coalition government gave us the original Solitary Islands Marine Reserve, and I know about that because I was one of a three-person advisory group to Tim Moore when he was minister in negotiating to set up that park. Fortunately, I, was, I wasn't in Sydney, I was up here, but um, the um, meetings he had with Wal Murray, big old Wal Murray, and Ian Causley, who was a local member, uh, in setting out the Marine Reserve in 1992 were legendary. <laughs> and I can almost hear them at Grafton. Um, the, the values that were argued then, and, uh, and they were, it was pretty straightforward, it was pretty simple. I think it was, it was either 72 or 76 species of coral was about the only conservation attribute we had any handle on. I forget, forget the guy who counted them, the original, did the original investigation, but it was a person whose name was bandied around a fair bit. Um, obviously the, the understanding and attitude was marine co conservation has progressed dramatically since then, since that day. Um, I, th I think it's, if there's a pattern, it's there that um, Labor governments are always good in opposition. <laughs> That's not much help. <laughs> good statement. Um, in early years, sometimes in government they're all right, and sometimes in the later years they, it's a bit unpredictable. Coalitions are not so good in opposition, and in, and in the early years of government, as we've found out, and we think, but become more unpredictable thereafter, and sort of un interesting things happened at the latter years of the Griner. At our coalition government. Um, we will no doubt continue to seek favours and advantage, all of us, from the political process, but its fruits and favours are unpredictable uh, and not necessarily a rational response to the environmental imperatives we face. So I advocate it's, it should not be our preferred process. Our preferred process should be one of, of um, working together. I need to go to the last slide. Um, I think a proper foundation for marine conservation should be built on three things. A, a sound policy framework, the use of the best available science and informed and supported negotiation between stakeholders. And I don't think we've really had any of that in, in anywhere near adequate amounts um, for the solitary islands. So, and I'll go back and, and fishers immediately cringe at this, but I'll go back, I had quite a bit of experience in the forestry process. What it consisted of, and it started way back in the the 80s, a $20 million funded National Forest and Timber Inquiry to get some of the ground facts out there in, in the arena. A National Forest Policy process which took a couple of years and was finally adopted in December 91 by the Federal Government and all states, so there was a sound policy framework. It then took from 91 to 96 to develop the agreed conservation criteria. They're the car criteria. And I differ a bit with Steve. They They've got a fair bit of a uniquely Australian flavour, the, the car criteria. They were developed in that process. I know I went to two of the three technical, um, oh, the, two of the five 
workshops and I had to read all of the three technical reports. So it was a, a process that brought everyone forward in their understanding. It took that period of time. Uh, it was a, um, and some of them reluctantly, and in some areas more agreement than others, but everybody in the end um, did come along with that program. There was a program of fully funded regional assessments. 50 plus million dollars spent on that. Um, a well-structured and supported and run negotiation process where the key stakeholders were given all the information, they were given the technology to analyse and the, the ability to analyse that information, their options, other people's options, etc. And adequate funds to implement the outcomes, the conservation and industry restructure outcomes. Now, I, I don't think we really had any of that. I was quite horrified in a submission to the recent wreck fishing inquiry that a government representative even attempted to, um, to deny that New South Wales even had a marine parks policy. <laughs> that was the you know, presentation of the wreck. Um, I think the development, the, the last point I won't have time to fully elaborate, the development of application of nationally agreed conservation criteria based on comprehensive, adequate and representative system of marine protected areas took a lot of the heat out of the forest reform process. Once we got settlement, I won't say complete agreement, we got the parties in the, in, in the end said, well, let, you know, there's enough in that that we'll continue and we, we'll play the game. Once we got that resolved, the process moved forward. It, it's, it's resulted in 20 years of relative peace in the forest industry. That mightn't last the end of the year, but because <laughs> there are new and significant changes about the Forestry Commission now. But um, people in the in the in the fishing industry or the marine who say that a car reserve is not appropriate for marine waters, all my experience through 20 plus years of um, mostly forest and a little bit of marine um, uh, experience says it does apply. The the ecosystems that follow similar patterns. They they have either water washing over them or air currents blowing over them and a little bit of water on land and a little bit of air above on marine. They, but the species within them have similar behavioural patterns, widely dispersed, sedentary, migratory, um, etc. The, the reproductive modes depend on the flows of the currents of the water and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there is a lot of similarity and if if a car reserve system works on land, I really think the overwhelming international opinion now is heading towards that, it, that it's appropriate for sea. That's what the scientists are saying unequivocally. So we've got to have go through whatever stages of technical reports of public consultation to settle this issue, to try and get agreement on it. It might, it might have variations around the edges, I think, but uh, until we get there, I don't think we'll have peace. Um, but I do think, potentially, we've, we've got more areas of agreement <laughs> between conservationists and fishers than there were areas of agreement between conservationists and the timber industry. You know, I think we've got a more solid foundation in our, our understanding of the nature and the condition and the threats to the resource than, than, the, than the timber industry had or even still has now. So I think we've got more potential to get there. The government sold us a dud. It didn't take us through a proper and support us through a proper process. Uh, we've got to force them to, to allow us to do that now, I believe. Thank you. Thank you.